Apple and Amazon are in trillion dollar companies. I mean, the, the idea that Bitcoin couldn't hit a multi-trillion dollar market cap, but one company, Apple, could hit a 1.5 trillion market cap is crazy. I think Bitcoin has huge upside from here. An interesting way to think about it is that very few of us have priced in Bitcoin succeeding. Like less than 1% of the world has come to the conclusion, yes, Bitcoin will succeed and they have bought and the price represents that. 99% haven't come to that conclusion yet. And when they do, Bitcoin's price will be much, much higher from here. Do me a favor, picture your favorite crypto app or exchange. Got it? Now I have five questions for you. Question number one, does your favorite app or exchange have fiat on and off ramps that do not charge you crazy fees? Question number two, does your app actually help you time your investments with machine learning and algorithms? Question number three, does your app or favorite exchange connect to multiple exchanges to get you best rates best liquidity, but also mitigate the risk of a central failure of one single order book? Question number four, is your favorite app or exchange Swiss made, but also licensed and regulated in the EU so that you can feel 100% reassured, but also sleep well at night? Question number five, is your favorite app or exchange fully aligned with your principles and values, 100% community centric and not VC backed? So if your answer to any of these questions is a no, what are you waiting for? Download the Swissborg Wealth app, join the new era of wealth management, and enjoy the ride. Dear crypto community blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, Dan Held from Kraken, someone who's highly respected on crypto Twitter, who's been in the game since the very, very early days. So we're going to hear some really cool stories, facts about Bitcoin, yield farming, and tons of other really cool topics. Before kicking off, a big shout out to Crypto Slate for the great support, one of the best news outlets in the crypto space. So thank you so much for that. We'll have links in the pinned comment below. So without further ado, Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you doing today? Doing well, Alex. Thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure, Dan. I mean, you're so highly respected in this space. And really, the first question that I want to ask you is, because you've been in the game for such a long time, you must have some crazy campfire stories related to the early days of Bitcoin that inspired you and that just, you know, got you excited about what's happening. Yeah, so there's a term uh, when we reference years in crypto or like years in Bitcoin, it's like dog years. So they, they last a really long time. I mean, the, the markets are so intense where you have your net worth going, you know, 10x in a matter of a year, but then dropping 80% the next year. You know, that sort of like really changes someone in terms of how they think through time. So I feel like I've been in crypto like, you know, like 100 years, like it's been forever. Um, and it's been interesting to see these cycles play out because I've been through three boom bust cycles in crypto early 13, late 2013, and 2017. And so I've seen Bitcoin go from $10 to 20,000, which has been a, a wild journey. Um, you know, some, I guess, let's see, some funny stories. Um, it, you know, uh, with Bitcoin.com, I was actually there when Roger Veer uh, bought it at Miami in 2014. So we, uh, wow. <laughs> so that was kind of a fun experience. I did the first redesign of Bitcoin.com. So I was working at I co-founded a product called Zero Block, which was bought by blockchain.com. And so I came on board as the first product manager and Bitcoin.com redesign was one of the first projects that we worked on. Uh, we leased it from Roger Veer. And uh, through that, we were able to drive some traffic to blockchain.com. So that was, uh, that was a pretty fun experience to just kind of be there in that moment to see when that uh, domain switched hands. 
Um, so you've got that, you know, back in San Francisco, when I first got into, <clears throat> I was into Bitcoin in 2012. And then 2013, I moved out to San Francisco and I started to go to the meetups out here. So meetups are like a group where you meet every, you know, once a month, you have beers and you talk about a certain topic. They have meetups for drones, AR, VR, any sort of tech you're into. The Bitcoin meetup had a dozen people. And at that time, it was like Charlie Lee, um, Brian and Fred from Coinbase, Jed McCaleb from Ripple Stellar, um, Jesse Powell from Kraken. And that's where I met Jesse for the first time, <clears throat> you know, because I currently work at Kraken. And and at that time, I mean, Kraken and, and Coinbase, these companies were tiny. <laughs> they were they were like maybe five people, you know, really, really small companies. And um, there was only a dozen of us there. And it was pretty wild to see like just all of us kind of hang out, talk about Bitcoin, you know, have some PBR beers. It was really cheap beers. Um, all of us were like, you know, it'd be really cool if Bitcoin hit like a thousand dollars someday. Like that'd be pretty wild, right? And then March 2013 came around and the price went from $10 to 260. And all of a sudden the meetup had like 300 people at it. So, you know, <laughs> it, it was a pretty wild time to see it go from this like tiny, I literally saw it go from a small niche community to something much bigger, much much more exciting, much more, you know, like th this is becoming like a movement. That is incredible. That is so cool. You mentioned some many, many interesting names and some of the, the cool figures in the space, some controversial as well. Was it that brotherhood in the beginning that made this succeed? Obviously, some people went down different routes, but uh, were there specific people that inspired you? Yeah, I mean, that's what made, I think, like the, the fork wars so painful is that it was kind of like brother against brother or, you know, really close community was divided, right? Like we were all on the same team, same dream before. And then uh, when, the you know, when Bitcoin cash came around, it, it kind of forked, literally forked the community. And so, um, you know, I think that, yeah, it's it's been a little bit, it's been a struggle to kind of see that evolve through time because in the beginning, the way that everyone approached it was like everyone was building something, even if you were just tinkering on your own app. Like everyone had an app, everyone had a website, or they were doing like, they were trying to contribute to Bitcoin Core. So everyone wanted to be part of the community by, by building. And I think that's very distinctly different than now, where very, very few people build. And what I mean by build is like build in a constructive way. So they go build a product or service that solves a problem, Lots of people launch a coin, you know, I think very few of those are productive. Um, but, you know, when it comes to like, you know, everyone is building an app, website, you know, people going through the, you know, the process of getting um, their state, uh, each, you know, money transmission license per state, you know, things were like just, just evolving, just coming into existence. So I think it was like a really exciting field of, of builders. It was a community of builders at that time. That makes a lot of sense. And obviously, so Dan, like on crypto Twitter, you're mainly vocal about Bitcoin, a massive Bitcoin supporter. What is it in particular that really attracts you? Is it the technological side, social impacts, revolutionary side, whatever, like what really caught you at the beginning and, and what are your big whys for Bitcoin? Yeah, that's a great question because I think a lot of people lump Bitcoin in with crypto and they kind of lump, they think that Bitcoin is just one of these many, many, many different crypto assets. But I think Bitcoin is distinctly different from everything else. When I first heard about Bitcoin in 2012, I understood Bitcoin's value prop as gold 2.0. I studied finance in undergrad, worked at a small investment firm outside of, right after college, and then got into tech via kind of a random stumble and bumble into Bitcoin. But with Bitcoin, it was clear to me because I went to undergrad, I was going to fi studying finance in undergrad during the 2008 financial crisis. And I realized that none of my teachers, none of my books, nor anyone on TV knew what the hell was going on. So um, yeah, that really challenged my faith in the system. And with Bitcoin, I immediately saw that as the solution for this problem. Now, did I go put my life savings all into it day one? No, it's pretty scary back then. You used to have to wire money to Japan to buy it, on, to buy it at Mt. Gox. So, you know, I didn't have that much money right after college. And, and that was a kind of a harrowing experience. So if you talk to any OG, you know they're OG if they've had to like use BitInstant or use Dewalla to send money over to Gox and have to wait like five days. BitInstant, you know, you could do that instantly, but it cost you like 10% spread. Um, and so when we look, you know, when we look at like, why was Bitcoin created? What problem is it solving? Blockchain technology was built to build Bitcoin. That's it. Like it was fundamentally chosen in terms of design parameters to build Bitcoin. 
Like blockchain is not a general purpose software that you can salt bay on anything and make it more valuable. Like blockchain technology has extreme design trade-offs. You know, just because there's a copy of the ledger, you know, from the fundamental problem of like, there's many copies of the ledger across all these different computers, well, it's extremely inefficient to store data. So whatever data you're storing on a blockchain needs to be high value data, like the store of value, like a transfer of value or smart contracts or something else. So when we look at blockchain technology, I think the best application of that is with Bitcoin. Bitcoin from a product perspective is solving a problem in the market. It solves the problem of trust. As Satoshi says, trust is, is required to make the existing system work. And that is like a fundamentally fragile component of finance. Uh, having Bitcoin removes trust from uh, with our central bank. So you don't have to trust your government and you don't have to trust your local bank. That's an incredible huge paradigm shift in human history because when you do this, and let's say Bitcoin succeeds, let's so if Bitcoin succeeds, it fundamentally changes the power structure across the world because money, which is a representation of stored time and energy that you spent to earn it, you know, for example, like the dollar value in your bank account represents like the aggregate life's energy that you've spent earning it. Um, that money is a fundamental human right in terms of like you have consent over your body your body and money and money is, a cons is, a, is an extension of your body. And so consent over your money is an incredibly important issue. And when we look at if Bitcoin succeeds, you know, this fundamentally changes who controls money and how money flows across the world. I mean, there is nothing more important than money. <laughs> money is, is, is every, it underpins all value, you know, it, and the preservation of someone's ability to store it and move it without any permission is a fundamental human right. So that's why I care about Bitcoin. That's why I think Bitcoin's mission is massive. Like if you look at, so there's a terminology in tech, in tech called TAM, Totable Addressable Market. So when you build a product or service, how big could it get? For example, like Amazon could get as big as all things sold, right? Which is a huge TAM. So with Bitcoin, the TAM is $250 trillion. Like that, it's, that's its total potential value it could be because uh, you've got real estate, gold, stocks and bonds, and fiat. Those all represent store of value. And so when people go, oh, it'd be really boring if Bitcoin only did gold, like if it was only digital gold, I'm like, that use case is 30x larger than all the other ones combined. <clears throat> so, you know, I think Bitcoin, blockchain technology is built to build Bitcoin. Bitcoin solves a fundamental problem in society that I think is like an ultimately a human rights issue. And it solves that to the tune of a very, very massive total bull trustable market. So for me, that is the only thing I'm personally interested in um, because I think make, ensuring that Bitcoin is understood, and that's what I try to do with a lot of my content is make it digestible, simple to understand. You know, Bitcoin um, succeeding, I think, is paramount for humankind's freedom. Um, so this is a really important issue for me. I think people can work on other interesting projects in the space, but for me, this is what I personally really care about. I love it. You looked at all angles right there, the social, the technological, the economic, the socioeconomic, and so many gems. But do you believe, Dan, right now, the gold 2.0 definition is the best definition for Bitcoin? Or is it kind of like the intersection of global electronic money plus gold? You know, it's, you know, it's really hard to pinpoint the perfect definition. Yeah, that's a great, great question. And, you know, since it's a protocol that anyone can use, you can use it for any purpose you'd like. Uh, when we examine how it's used and when we examine how it will be used when transaction fees rise over time, which they will, um, that very much limits the number of use cases that Bitcoin can have. For example, Bitcoin is not useful for micropayments on layer one. Um, when it comes to store of value versus medium exchange or a more commerce aspect, store of value is incredibly important and, is it, and it is the first stage of a, the evolution of money. Before you want to transact with it, you'll want to hold it which is storing value in it. So the store value stage has to occur before it becomes a widespread medium of exchange. Now, certainly you can use Bitcoin to pay vendors across the world, and, you know, large, large transactions, right? Like, let's say I need to pay five employees and they're paid a thousand dollars a month. You know, that may, that still might make sense on Bitcoin layer one, <clears throat> um, but certainly not for like a coffee payment. Um, when we look at, when we look at Bitcoin's there's all sorts of spec. There's a whole spectrum to look at this. Like there is what it's useful for today, which I think is the most applicable way to view it and what it will be useful for in the future. So 
as transaction fees rise, that it will crowd out any other use case other than one that's a very high value transfer, which is mainly store of value transactions or large settlement transactions. Uh, this is great because that means that Bitcoin is rising in, in utility and rising in usage. Um, Bitcoin store of value is incredibly important, especially at this stage, because as Bitcoin's price increases as a speculative store of value, more people become aware of it and then buy in anticipation of the price going higher. So Bitcoin being a speculative store of value is entirely congruent with its growth trajectory, where it moves in these giant boom bust cycles. Um, transaction fees rise, user adoption rise, uh, more and more people own Bitcoin and hodl Bitcoin. And then, you know, once a certain percentage of the population owns Bitcoin, like let's say 30% or 40%, and they're starting to store lots of value in it, then the more the medium of exchange aspects become more and more important. Also for medium of exchange, layer two technology has to be more well built out and a little bit easier to use. I'm not saying that it's too hard to use. I'm just saying, you know, in terms of like integrate, like for example, that many exchanges use Lightning yet, which I'm a huge proponent of Lightning. It's just, you know, these things need to happen before, um, you know, when you bring on a hundred million people, they all can't transact on layer one. Uh, the fees would be way too prohibitive, even for like larger values. So eventually those are pushed to layer two or other sort of settlement mechanisms. Um, so as we see Bitcoin grow in adoption, it seems clear that store value is probably the best use case for it over the next decade. There are certainly other use cases for it. Uh, there's, there's a huge long tail of use cases that I don't even know of how it's being used, but some other people are using it for that use case. But store value is, I'd say, the predominant use case for the next decade. When you were talking about fiat currencies earlier, you, you posted a, a tweet which was absolutely epic, Dan. You wrote, Bitcoin will last longer than the U.S. dollar. I'd love to ask you a little bit more about that. Obviously, you had a nice debate on Twitter. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more why you believe that? You know, a lot of people, you have people like Peter Schiff saying that if the U.S. dollar will eventually go through hyperinflation, he maybe exaggerates a bit. Other people uh, have different arguments. What is your point towards that? I think Bitcoin is the final evolution of money. Like we've moved from these different stages of like shells, beads, gold, fiat, and kind of a mixture of both of those. And now we have Bitcoin. Like this is the final evolution. I don't think there will be another money after Bitcoin. We have our primitive human mindset, which goes, oh, well, things changed before. Well, they'll change in the future. And I don't see why that would be the case. Bitcoin is digital. It satisfies every aspect that you want from money. Once a network effect is wrapped around Bitcoin, let's say 60% of the world population owns it and uses it, then it's already one, I think, in perpetuity for forever. I don't think I don't think there will be another money in our solar system after Bitcoin. And so for me, that's an incredibly important moment because we look at all monies previously and Bitcoin has such superior characteristics as a new species of money that all the other forms of money look you know, pale in comparison to those characteristics that enable it to survive and thrive. So I fully believe that due to Bitcoin's characteristics that it will outlive any fiat money ever created before. And I think it will be the final money. Um, again, once, you, once Bitcoin has been created and this, this instance has occurred of it succeeding, I don't see another possibility of another money ever coming. And people go, oh, well, aren't there improvements that can be made? I don't think so. I think it is the final evolution of money. I think all the parameters are near perfect. And as we've seen 10,000 other cryptocurrencies created, those all either validate or invalidate that those parameters were perfect. Most of them validate it. When they fail, it validates that Bitcoin should not have been built that way. And so those, those all go back to Bitcoin being this, I would say, probably final form of money. It's funny because some people call Bitcoin the Internet of money, but you don't even need the Internet, right? You can go through waves, you know, radio waves for transacting. I've seen people do it here on desktops through waves and and they're obviously satellites and stuff like that. So is the Internet of money actually kind of undermining the, the truth behind Bitcoin? <laughs> that, that's a pretty <laughs> that's a funny question. So, yeah, I mean, you, it's really cool how Bitcoin can be utilized. I mean, Bitcoin survives partitioning of the world's Internet. This is, for example, like a circumstance where, let's say, China and the US cut a fiber optic line between them, which won't happen, but hypothetically, you know, Bitcoin can even survive scenarios like that, which is really cool. Um, Bitcoin is very, very resilient. Um, that, and due to Bitcoin's, you know, very, very small block size, that enables Bitcoin full nodes to utilize different sort of uh, communication mechanisms. Satellite, uh, you can do over the air using um, ham radio, 
which is really, really, really cool. I, I love that stuff, using ham radio to propagate Bitcoin transactions. I mean, that is the ultimate resiliency. There's no way for the government to jam ham radio transactions everywhere. So that, that is like the last, even if they turn off the internet, you can still transact in Bitcoin using ham radio. Um, and that's due to Bitcoin's really, really efficient architecture. So I think that's super cool in terms of Bitcoin's resiliency. Um, you know, I don't think it's too much of a misnomer to say it's the internet, the, the money, money for the internet or the internet of money. Um, because it's, it's a common sort of analogy that someone can, you, you know, wrap their head around. So I think that's, it's probably useful for a lot of people who don't understand what Bitcoin is. Awesome. Beautifully said. And I'd love to ask you, Dan, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of people talk about how Bitcoin was is the mother of all ships and created this whole economy and and DeFi would then become became created through this whole phenomenon for you, generally speaking. And obviously, I know you're really hardcore into Bitcoin, but how do you feel about DeFi? Is this do you see more positive than negatives? What's your general overview? Yeah, so I've seen a couple different narratives come and go, and I wrote an article called Quantum Narratives, which is the rise and fall of narratives in crypto. I've been around for eight years, which is forever, and I've seen a lot come and go. So 2014, we had a huge wave of altcoins. Dogecoin is probably the one that most remember that survived from that era. Um, and then 2017, we had ICOs, which are probably much more top of mind for everyone. And then now we've got like DeFi and other products. And some of these were ICOs and now it's kind of blending together. You know, for me, I constantly look at the blockchain space from a uh, product, product perspective. So is this solving a problem? Fundamentally, any protocol or product or service has to solve a problem. We're humans. The protocol interacts with humans to solve a problem. At some level, the protocol could interact with software, which then interacts with humans. But ultimately, this protocol needs to solve a problem for the humans. A lot of these are being sold as solutions looking for a problem. So I, I think that that kind of violates a fundamental product tenant in Silicon Valley, which is that you should always be looking at solving a problem. If you do not have protocol market fit or product market fit, aka your product is solving a problem, then you fundamentally haven't built a product. You've built a shiny thing looking for something. Um, in crypto, sometimes you have a situation where it doesn't solve anything and there's but there's value attached to it so that it might be worth a billion dollars because people hypothetically assign value to it um, so it's really hard to parse out what success looks like success from a classic product perspective would be like are people using it to solve a problem which the answer is no but the value fluctuates and the value <laughs> rises <clears throat> so people are like oh well it must be succeeding and i don't necessarily think that's the case it's more of people speculate on it on it succeeding so the space is very rife with speculation, um, which isn't a bad or good thing. I think people are free to go buy and sell whatever they like. I've got my personal opinion on like, just liking Bitcoin, but others like other things as well. Um, you know, I think that it, I don't, uh, so I think most Bitcoiners, by the way, and this is a common misconception. Most people think that Bitcoiners are, that Bitcoiners have rejected everything else because they haven't spent the time to research it. I think it's the opposite. Most Bitcoiners I know didn't start with Bitcoin. They started with everything else and then landed on Bitcoin. Um, and I think, you know, for like DeFi and stuff like that, I think Bitcoiners largely, you know, in the spirit of it, were like, oh, well, hell yeah. Like, sure, I'd love to have this, this and this, right? Like, I'd love to decentralize all the things. Like, I think from a fundamental like ethos level, Bitcoiners would largely agree. We just disagree upon the method, um, the the exploration of it, and the lack of like a very like lax attitude towards risk. Bitcoiner Bitcoiners are very risk averse, and so when we see these different experiments, which are these different DeFi protocols, going and, and doing things that are really really poor on like risk management, or you know let's say, let's say they set up their governance really poorly, you know it ruins the experiment, and so. You know, I think Bitcoiners largely are aligned with the ethos of like decentralizing power, um, building this new financial system that's independent from everyone else. But they're very, very realistic about the trade offs, about how this can actually be built. And when you dig into a lot of these, you know, they sound really cool, but some of them are not exactly like rooted in something, you know, really concrete. That's a really good answer. And, you know, like based on what you were saying here, it really reminds me of you know, the whole C5 versus DeFi in terms, in terms of yielding, in terms of actually lending, et cetera, et cetera. And, and some people tell me, you know, like, 
oh, I, I don't have a lot of money now. I'd love to open up, you know, a savings account or a yielding account and then use that money to buy Bitcoin, right? Because Bitcoin has, like you said, has a decentralized power, but still people need money to be able to buy it. Um, so I would love to ask you in terms of people who, you know, get into yielding or interest simply with a stable coin or so forth. Are you more on the CFI lending side, on the DeFi lending side? Do you have personal preferences at this point? Yeah, that's a great question. So CFI and DeFi compete with each other. They're not like so distinctly different that they would um, not have any competition. That's where I think the DeFi side doesn't doesn't really recognize that, which I find kind of weird. Um, so if you look at yields for like, let's say you have wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum, like the yields for that are pretty low. I think I, I think if you look at like Compound and a few others, um, not to say they're, they're bad products or anything, but you know, it's really I don't really understand how a consumer would look at their DeFi yield rates. So some of these DeFi yield rates you guys hear are crazy, like 2,200%, right? Those are very hyper speculative versus like the wrapped Bitcoin being utilized for like more safe things, I think are a very, very low yield, like like two bips yield, you know? So when you look at CFI, CFI rates will be much higher because they can take on more risk. Um, they have probably better, you know, it's centralized. So there's a lot of different mechanisms mechanisms they can use to control risk versus DeFi. You put it out in the field and if there's a there's, if there's a risk and it blows up, then there's no recourse like it is it is done. Um, so I think with CFI versus DeFi from a risk level, you, we understand our risks with CFI. With centralized finance, we understand that lending is a 4000 year old financial transaction. And that comes with good risk monitoring, comes with good credit analysis of your counterparties. I know the risks involved there. I don't know exactly who they've lent out my coins to, but I know the risks there. Well, actually with some platforms like Bitfinex, um, Bitfinex has lending within its own ecosystem. So I would know my counterparty, which is Bitfinex. Um, so, you know, there's a fundamentally different risk model there where in DeFi, I don't know what risk I'm taking. Like I have no idea if the smart contract will blow up in 10 years or two years or one year, or if the, you know, and then will the yield. And then, so that's on the risk side. And then it's like the risk return. So then when I look at my yield, my yield's much higher in CFI. And so there's this whole, you know, like I have to go convince a consumer to take on unknown risk and earn a lower yield. You know, I think that's a really hard sell for a lot of people. Um, and so with, with DeFi yields, I think like, this is something that they're going to, you know, it's funny too. So that's on the lending side, right? Like I want to lend out my Bitcoin um, or lend out my ETH or whatever and, and earn a yield. And then on the borrowing side, you know, you can borrow money against your coin. So you can you, you can post 120 Bitcoin as collateral and borrow 60 Bitcoin worth against that. Um, I find that, you know, it's kind of funny though too, because in CFI I can get un, <laughs> uncollateralized borrowing. Right. So like, I, I can actually go borrow 50K without posting any collateral. So I think that that's kind of like a fundamentally <clears throat> different. It, it, it's kind of weird because I think like CFI and DeFi folks, DeFi folks claim they're solving problems. And I'm like, yeah, I think there's a certain subset of people who like over collateralized loans. Uh, but most people need uncollateralized loans. They don't they don't have any collateral and they need to borrow money. So I think they're they fundamentally compete. Um, and I think they, they compete and will over time see what consumers have preference for. But ultimately, like they're going to have to have a very strong value proposition for a consumer to want to switch. Um, the, GUI, the interface, the GUI is going to have to be great. You know, there are some advantageous um, mechanisms there, you know, that require no KYC AML for DeFi products. So we'll see if consumers decide to pick that over CFI and if long term, you know, DeFi, there's not, um, you know, bug riddled with bugs. But I think you know, we can cross our fingers and hope that that doesn't happen. And it'll be interesting to see what plays out over the next 5, 10, 20 years. That's a really good point because there's not really a track record, right, for people. And I love the way you mentioned that, Dan, because there are risks on both sides, but at least on the centralized side, you can identify or you know what the risks are, like default risk or security risk, right? So that's a really interesting angle. And you wrote an article about uh, Bitcoin yield farming the other day. Do you mind telling us a little bit more? Like it's kind of a new topic. Most people think about stable coins, right? Or going into a specific pool and buying the food coin. Uh, could you tell, could you educate us on the, the Bitcoin yield farming side? Yeah, sure. So I, you know, I, I use the title yield farming because it's hot right now. But yeah, this is essentially earning yield on your Bitcoin. So earning a return on your Bitcoin is the, the topic. And 
For me, I've hodled for eight years and I, I think it's really interesting to explore how to earn yield on my coin. Um, you know, for me, I'm a hardcore hodler, so I plan on hodling for a very, very long time. And I would love to earn a yield from my Bitcoin versus having to sell it. Um, you know, I could borrow dollars against it, but now I'm actually becoming levered. And so earning a yield is a really attractive opportunity. Now, earning yield comes with risk. That's why you earn the yield. <laughs> you know, so there's, you know, I'd recommend hodling a majority of your coins and not touching any of this stuff. But for a certain percentage of your coins, it's, it'd be interesting to explore these yield uh, opportunities. And so, you know, what I, what I found in my own exploration, so I put my own money up into these services because I would only recommend these or I'd only explore these if I did it myself. I would feel a bit, a bit disingenuous if I didn't go risk my own capital. So for example, with BlockFi, BlockFi is, so BlockFi and Bitfinex are two classic models where you lend your coin to a counterparty. So you give them your Bitcoin and then they go lend that out. Uh, with BlockFi, they lend that out to many, many, many different counterparties. With Bitfinex, Bitfinex uses those coins for their margin pool. So people who borrow uh, coin on Bitfinex, they pay a certain rate to borrow coin. So those are two methods to earn a yield with just lending, and those rates fluctuate between like 4 and 8, 8%. So around 4% on BlockFi and 8% with Bitfinex. That rate changes daily. These numbers aren't, aren't lock set. You know, these are they're not fixed. And so I put 10 Bitcoin in BlockFi for the last year and a half, a year and a quarter to try that out. And I might go try out a few other services as well just to see what those are like. Um, for me, this is like a lifelong thing where I plan on taking these coins and trying to ensure that I don't lose them. I really, 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 you know, since it's my own money, I am constantly reading and, and trying to learn more about these services so I can better understand my risk that I'm taking. Um, because the more you can quantify the risk, the better you can quantify the risk for the for the return. And so those are on the lending side, you've got BlockFi and Bitfinex. There's other parties as well, but I think those two are really They've been around for, you know, BlockFi is really well known and Bitfinex has been around for forever. And then if we look at uh, another yielding strategy, it's called covered calls. So the TLDR of what a covered call is, is a covered call is selling your upside. So when you start, it's an option. So it's a call option and you are the seller of it. It's called covered because you own the underlying asset. You own Bitcoin, which means if, if uh, the contract is, um, if your coins are called away, then you have a coin to deliver. So this is how we would go in theory. Not in theory, but in, in reality. So we have December uh, December 18th, 2020 contracts. So that's the expiration. And there's a strike price. Let's say $40,000 of Bitcoin. So I, as the seller of the call option, I go, I will sell you my Bitcoin um, at December 18th, 2020 for $40,000 of Bitcoin, no matter how high the price goes. If the price goes to $100,000, I'm still selling it to you at $40,000. You can go to $60,000, I'm still selling it to you for $40,000. Um, the buyer of that option likes that because anything above that price, you know, is that's value capture for them. Now, the buyer of the option pays me something called a premium for that opportunity, for that option. So, uh, you know, for example, the uh, a couple of weeks ago, I calculated the yield on this and it's around 4 to 6% four covered calls at $40,000 of Bitcoin. So here, here's the situation, how it plays out two different ways. Um, so I earn the yield immediately, so I can take that premium and I can do whatever I want with it, which is really, really cool, uh, versus these other yielding products, which are more monthly. So you earn the yield up front, which is awesome because you could technically go reinvest that and, and you know actually have a higher annualized yield. But here's how an option would work for a $40,000 strike in December. At, at that date, if Bitcoin is below $40,000, I keep the premium and I keep my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin are returned to me. If it is above $40,000, I keep my Bitcoin. I also get all of the price appreciation from the price now all the way through $40,000. So I, I keep all that, but then I, I've given up any upside above $40,000. So that, that's how a covered call would look. And for me, you know, like in the closer you, sh the closer the strike price is to the current price, the yields get really, really high, like 50 to 70%, because the likelihood your Bitcoins will be called away are very, very high. <laughs> there's, there's a whole dynamic there where the farther out you go, the less likely your Bitcoins will be called away. I mean, I think we all find it a very low circumstance where Bitcoin's $40,000 in December. That'd be, that'd be awesome. I'd be really happy if that was the circumstance, but I find it to be low. 
Um, you can earn a yield on, on selling very, very out of the money is the terminology covered calls. Um, so that's strategy number two. Strategy number three is uh, using coin joins. So with coin joins, people want to mix their Bitcoin with you. So there's makers and there's takers. Takers are like, hey, I want to mix my coin today. So they need someone to mix their coins with called the maker. The maker goes, cool, I don't mind mixing my coins with you, but you have to pay me for that opportunity. So the taker will provide a fee to mix their Bitcoins with the maker. So you can earn a yield on your Bitcoin uh, being a maker for coin joins. And it's a really interesting opportunity. I didn't even know this until a few, until like a year ago, because you can earn around a half a percent to a percent a year, but this is money that the risk is almost zero. Um, you do have to hold Bitcoin on a hot wallet, but you hold your private keys the whole time. So no one else touches your coin. Um, it is mixed, but this is all done in a decentralized fashion. So it's a really cool, and then coin join, uh, it's called Join Market, by the way. Join Market has been around for five years. It's open source and it's built, you know, it's built, right, you know, it's, there's a client that's built right in to where you can do a yield, kind of a yielding mechanism where it auto, auto does this for you. But it's really cool because it requires no KYC AML. Um, it is very, very private. You're, you're enhancing your privacy as you're doing it. And it's totally decentralized and you don't have to worry about any sort of custodial risk or any counterparty risk. Now, the yield is very low. And the other part to this is that depending on your jurisdiction, you are, you know, you are mixing your coins and you're being paid for it. And that may run afoul of certain regulatory, uh, certain regulations. So, you know, I'm not here to prescribe any one of these as something that someone should do. I'm more describing how you can do it across all these different uh, mechanisms. And then finally, there's Lightning. So if you run a Lightning node and you have channels open with other other folks, if payments are routed through you, there's a small fee attached. Um, the rates on that are super low and the risk, I would say, is somewhat high since it's still in beta, I think is the official terminology. It moved out of alpha into beta. So um, that's another really cool decentralized way to earn yield to where you don't have to trust any other counterparty. But Lightning is still very new technology and the yield that you earn is so low um, that I think it'd be more for exploration and where someone would, want, someone would want to do that. So those are the four strategies that I highlighted. I think, you know, you, you only want to risk a small part of your stack on any one of these, but I think it's a really interesting way for folks who might have a ton of Bitcoin to where you may, ne you may never have to sell your Bitcoin. If you may manage your risk right, if you understand the risks that you're taking, you could essentially earn yield on your Bitcoin for forever and never sell as the value goes up. So I think that's a really, really cool opportunity. And that's why I explored it myself. That's so fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing those four yield hacking approaches or st strategies. Uh, really, really interesting. And I, I must ask you, so you were talking about price targets and striking points. Um, you know, some people these days, and obviously we, we can all speculate, but in the beginning or maybe two years ago, people saw Bitcoin going to 100K, 200K. But nowadays it's going more into the seven digits uh, in terms of the potential price in the future. You had a really cool Twitter post where you're talking about 60% of people in the world access the Internet and kind of kind of having this cryptic message about showing that Bitcoin still has huge potential. Do you mind elaborating a little bit on that? Yeah, I mean, if we look at the global store of value, uh, uh, global store of value TAM, total bull trustable market, we're talking hundreds of trillions of dollars of value. Bitcoin today, I think, is only around 200 billion or 240 billion. I forget. I don't I don't check the market cap daily. Um, at that at that value, Bitcoin is very, very tiny. I mean, gold is 20 trillion and you have real estate at 250 trillion and you have all the fiat in the world. I forget. I think it's like 11 or 12 trillion. These are enormous numbers. I mean, Apple and Amazon are in trillion dollar companies. I mean, the idea that Bitcoin couldn't hit a multi-trillion dollar market cap, but one company, Apple, could hit a 1.5 trillion market cap is crazy. I think Bitcoin has huge upside from here. Um, very small percentage of the world. You know, people talk about, there's a term, uh, uh, people talk about efficient market hypothesis, which is that is the price is the is like are all expectations around the price baked in in terms of like does Bitcoin's price today represent the aggregate feeling of the world and and, and the answer is yes because the price would be something else if it wasn't but um, an interesting way to think about it is that very few of us have priced in Bitcoin succeeding like less than one percent of the world has come to the conclusion yes Bitcoin will succeed and they have bought and the price represents that ninety nine percent haven't come to that conclusion yet and when they do 
Bitcoin's price will be much, much higher from here. So I think that's like a really, really uh, interesting way to think through it, which is that you know, Bitcoin has so much more price, price appreciation from here. We, we haven't had any central banks buy it. No, no banks have bought it. Very few hedge funds have bought it. And when we look at it from that perspective, it's like, wow, there is so much money in the world and a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of it is, is in Bitcoin. And by the way, going back to covered calls, I would never sell a covered call at 40,000 a year from now, though. Like you are definitely playing a game with covered calls where you hypothesize that Bitcoin's value won't rise in the short term up too much. Um, but I, to be clear, I'm extremely bullish on Bitcoin. I think long term, it's in the hundreds of thousands, the millions of price, like price per coin. And I would never sell, like for me, you know, this is in December, right? So you've got, it's three months away. Um, I find it unlikely Bitcoin would 4X in three months. So that's a game I would be playing with these covered calls. But, um, you know, for me, I clearly don't want to sell my coin over time. So it's, it's a bit of a game on where, what strike price you choose. Um, but yeah, I think Bitcoin's price will be, you know, I think, I think 2021 is going to be a very exciting year. Um, all the historical sort of uh, cycles point to 2021 being a, a year of price, appreci uh, price appreciation combined with the U.S. election happening in late 2020 and a bunch of socioeconomic issues, you know, rising and, and boiling at the surface, I think, set us up for a really crazy bull run. And I think your comparison right there, Dan, was absolutely pinpoint perfect because Apple, just one company reaching $2.3 trillion in market cap, where Bitcoin is not even one tenth. There's definitely scale there, isn't there? <laughs> totally. Totally. Did it actually reach $2.3 trillion? Yeah, I think it was just oh, three wow. weeks ago. 2.1, sorry, 2.1 trillion just three wow. weeks ago. Yeah, it's really... <laughs> the first U.S. company to hit over $2 trillion market cap in the history of U.S. stocks. And I think, yeah, I think two trillion. What is that in uh, Bitcoin? It's, I think that's a hundred thousand at two trillion. I, f I forget. Yeah. I, it's early in the morning here. I can't <laughs> do men mental math. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean that's where people. For me, it seems like a slam dunk. It, it's funny because a lot of people go, "Oh well, you know, Bitcoin's never going to like hundred X," and I'm like, "We don't know that. It, it very well might." And then also, it's funny because I'm like. <laughs> The risk that you're, the return you're earning in Bitcoin per unit of risk is phenomenal right now. I mean, when I was at it, when it was ten dollars, is worth ten dollars because no one, none of us like really thought it was going to be anything bigger. Like we were hoping it would be, but the world priced Bitcoin's price expectations at ten. Like, I mean, ten dollars a Bitcoin, like we barely had any products or services, and now the industry is so robust. You know, yeah. Kraken is a multi-billion-dollar company. This is really, really cool. I mean, this is a huge. It's a big space now, and in the next bull run, you know, Kraken could be like a fifty billion dollar company. You know, these are these are incredible moments to see like Bitcoin mature and Bitcoin get to this stage and de-risk. You know, we went through a fork war. We had all sorts of early developer issues. We had the founder walk away fine. We had like bugs and flaws found, and Bitcoin has survived all of that. And it's the fact that it survived that makes like this next appreciation cycle incredibly interesting because the return per unit of risk has never been better. And I'm glad you brought up Kraken. And this is a personal endorsement, Dan. To me, it is probably the best crypto exchange on the planet by far from all angles. Uh, but with, I want to follow up on that because there was some really interesting news recently and a lot of people are trying to understand what it means. But obviously, congratulations, you know, for obtaining the bank charter and the, the approval to launch a U.S. bank. Uh, could you tell us a little bit of what does that mean specifically and why it matters? Yeah, so with... Uh, crypto exchanges, we are built on top of legacy infrastructure. So we've got banks we have to rely on. We have payment processors. We have um, all sorts of different ways to transfer value of fiat in and out of the exchange. By having a banking license, we are, this now unlocks a ton of new opportunity for us to be much more deeply embedded in removing ourselves from these choke points. So um, there are these choke points where, for example, getting a banking uh, getting a bank account in crypto early on was really, really tough. Coinbase had a very special relationship with Silicon Valley Bank, but that was a, a relationship that Silicon Valley Bank did not extend to other crypto companies. And so uh, Kraken, similarly, in Europe, had a good relationship with Fidor Bank, and that enabled us to get early market share there. So by having our own banking charter, we can now get directly plugged in and we don't have to rely on these banks. And so that, that's a really cool opportunity in terms of the services we can provide and in ter like we can launch all new sort of features and services that are very close to like what your bank can offer. And then 
Um, you know, from a risk perspective, now we are our own bank. We don't have to trust any bank or rely on any other bank. That is fantastic. I'm really excited to see the, the future of Kraken, as you mentioned. For those watching out there, Dan Held, so you spell it H-E-L-D, at Dan Held on Twitter. There's also a website called danheld.com. This gentleman here just drops gems after gems after gem. If you don't know him already, don't forget to follow Dan on Twitter. Are there any other like social media like outlets where you're active these days, or is it mainly Twitter for you, Dan? Well, I'm just spinning up my YouTube channel. It's Dan Held there too. I don't know if you're going to guess that, but <laughs> it's yeah, it's basically anywhere you know on, on uh, Twitter and um, LinkedIn is where I post most of my content. Twitter is where I'm at most of the time. And then YouTube uh, just got into streaming as of last week. Uh, it's something fun that I'm exploring. I uh, don't have a really big following over there yet, but it's I'm just exploring like the relationship between streaming and seeing if there's like a really cool like live interaction way I can t t talk to people. I know that before I've gone on live streams on YouTube, for example, like the Altcoin Daily guys and uh, didn't ask me anything, which is really, really fun. So uh, yeah, I would say check me out on Twitter for now. That, that's probably the best spot to find me. Or if you like longer form blog content, danheld.com is a great spot to go. Awesome. We'll definitely put all the links below, guys. You've heard it from Dan Hell telling you everything from the origins of Bitcoin to the evolution to hacks for yield farming and tons of gems diving really deep into Bitcoin today. Don't forget to like, subscribe and blast that bell notification so that you can get access to more timeless interviews. Thank you so much for watching, guys. See you next week premiering at a PC near you Wednesday, 8 o'clock BST. Take care, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Cheers.